Alrighty, so we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we'll start with introductions and uh, the establishment of a quorum, but I have a few uh, notes before we uh, jump in. Welcome everyone uh, to our May meeting of the BPP Advisory uh, Committee. Um, uh, I'd ask the advisory committee members and uh, speakers generally to uh, announce themselves by name before speaking for clarity of the official record. Uh, and all uh, advisory committee members are able to unmute themselves to speak at any time uh, during the meeting. So please feel free to uh, chime in if you need. You don't need to wait for a specific um, uh, invitation. All those will be forthcoming. I'll ask you to um, to ask for questions of any of our presenters or to provide feedback. Uh, please do place yourself back on mute when not speaking so we can reduce uh, background noise for all participants. Uh, we will be welcoming public comment uh, on every item on the agenda. We'll actually start with uh, a public comment period for any items not on the agenda. Um, there is a process by which our, our moderator will help us with that. And so there'll be, and he'll give better, he'll give more directions in the moment as, as far as raising your hand and, and so forth. Uh, when you're called upon, you'll be unmuted and you'll have three minutes for your public comment. So I wanted to be clear for that, that every public comment is limited uh, to three minutes. And then after three minutes, you would be placed uh, back on mute. And as a public uh, member or as a public com commenter, um, you are limited to one uh, comment per agenda item, although you can comment on as many agenda items separately as, as you would like. Um, in the in the public comment for items not on the agenda, we do have uh, a time limit of 30 cumulative minutes for all uh, commenters. Uh, and uh, one other note about public comments, which I'll repeat, is that it is not an appropriate or effective venue, certainly for posing questions uh, to the Bureau or to the advisory committee. Um, we aren't uh, allowed in the format of the meeting to engage or have any back and forth. And so um, it is your opportunity to express an opinion or a concern. Uh, those of course are, are noted uh, by BPP staff and, and taken as input uh, from us as advisory committee members, but it isn't a forum for a dialogue. Uh, most commonly what happens is if you have a question specific to the BPPE or a concern and you're looking for a response, uh, sometimes those come up in public comment and a much better way for you to address that would be to email your concern or your question uh, directly to the, to the Bureau at BPPE at DCA.ca dot gov and that is in the agenda as well that link so you can email there if you have a question and finally today's meeting will be run according to the Bay Keen open meeting act and uh, the brown act so welcome again we'll start with our establishment of a forum um, my name is joseph holt uh, i am an institutional representative and a chair of the committee uh, and then lee if you introduce yourself Hi, Lee Farron. I'm a student representative and the vice chair, even though the slide says otherwise. This is my first one as vice chair. <laughs> That's right. Thanks, Lee. And uh, Margaret, would you uh, introduce yourself? Margaret Ryder. I'm a consumer representative. Thanks, Margaret. Hello. Good to hear your voice again. Um, Robert uh, Boykin. Hi, Robert Boykin, uh, public mm -hmm. member. Thank you. And uh, Kansen Chu. Kansen Chu, uh, community public member. Excellent. And Melanie? Don't, no, don't think that Melanie's on the call. Uh, Tess Dubois Carey. Good morning. Tess Dubois Carey, institutional representative. Very good. Thank you. And then do we have a representative from Senator Roth's office? or from assembly member uh, Jose Medina's office. Okay, uh, and Richie, can, I believe we have a quorum, but can you confirm in the absence of Melanie that we still have a quorum? Yes, we have a quorum. Perfect, thank you, Richie. Very good. So as noted, the first thing we'll start with is a, a public comment period for items not on the agenda. So having had opportunity in advance of the meeting to review the agenda, if you have a, a comment or concern or something that you want to bring up to the advisory committee, 
uh, that is not on the agenda, this is the time to do that. Again, we won't respond to that, but uh, we may, of course, take note or staff may, and we might uh, put it on a future agenda item. This is, again, an open time for public to comment on anything not on the agenda. So I'll hand it over to our moderator to help me with that. We are now open for public comment not on the agenda. As previously stated, we'll uh, allow three minutes for public comment. You'll be given a 30 second warning before your time expires. Uh, if you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. I believe I've seen a couple mobile users, so note you may have to hit the dot 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 uh, at the bottom center of your screen in order to uh, find uh, your public comment. You can also raise your hand. Dial-in users can raise their hand by dialing star three. Now we're going to wait just a few moments, uh, about 15 seconds, to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue with the agenda? Yes, thank you very much, David. We'll move to our next uh, agenda item, which is uh, the review and approval of the minutes of our last meeting, which was in February. And so we'll start um, by opening up to the advisory committee members. Does anybody have any uh, notes, comments, or revisions or corrections on the uh, minutes from our last meeting? Okay, hearing none, before we um, approve those minutes, we'll, we'll open to public comment on this agenda item. Um, so, uh, David, if you'd please open up again for public comment on agenda item three, which is the review and approval of the minutes of our past, past meeting. Point of order, um, I'm not your legal counsel, but I believe you may need uh, a, a motion and a second in order to... Uh, yeah, yeah, I was thinking of, I think last time we had held that until after public comment, but I'm happy to do it's that. Really up, this is Christy Shield. It's really up to the committee when they want to take it, but um, you have to absolutely take public comment before you act on any motion. So if you want to take comment twice on any item, you can. Um, if you want to only take comment after a motion is on the floor, you can as well. But you okay, have sure. to absolutely take comment when there's a motion on the floor. Right now, we don't have a motion. Right, but we will have to approve the minutes. And so I can we can do public comment only once then, uh, Christy, if uh, we take the motion and then do public comment. Is that correct? Well, um, you can take public comment at any time, but whenever there is a motion on the floor, you have to take comment before you vote. Right. So given that we don't want to do it twice in this case. Um, yeah, correct. Then you would, would want a motion. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll move. To approve the uh, minute. This is Kansen. Yes, thank you, Kansen. Do we have a second? I'll second. This is Tess. Thank you, Tess. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes as uh, submitted and as have been available. We'll at this time open to public comment uh, re uh, regarding the minutes from our last meeting and the pending motion. We are now open for public comment on the motion. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Anyone, including dial-in users, may raise their hand. Dial-in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We're going to wait just a few seconds to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to return to the motion? I do, yes. Thank you, David. So we have a motion to approve the minutes as written. Uh, and uh, I'll go ahead and do a, a quick, or Rich, you, could you want to do the roll call vote? Sure. Yes. Thanks. Uh, Joseph Holt? Yes. Lee Farron? Yes. Robert Boykin? Yes. Kansen Chu? Yes. Tess Dubakari? Yes. Margaret Ryder? Yes. It's all present members. Thank you, Richie. 
All right, so that concludes our third agenda item. We'll move on to the fourth agenda item, which is remarks by a representative of the Department of Consumer Affairs. Lovely, and this is this is Debbie Cochran, Bureau Chief, and I will point it over to um, Judy Bucarelli from DCA to give the update. I see Judy's here, but I also see she's on mute. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, good morning, committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to provide the Department of Consumers update today. Since 2017, the state of California has participated in Public Service Recognition Week to express appreciation for civil servants and the essential work they do. During the week of May 7th, DCA celebrated the week with a department-wide appreciation message to staff, social media highlighting staff testimonials, and ended the week with a video highlighting employee service. On behalf of DCA, I would like to express thanks to the committee and bureau staff for hard work throughout the year. Moving on, I will provide a diversity, equity, and inclusion update. Established last fall, the department's DEI steering committee is comprised of 12 executive leaders from the board's bureaus and the department and has been working on many items, including updating the strategic planning process, training, and development of an informational DEI fact sheet, which was distributed to leadership. The strategic planning process has been updated to embed DEI into the process, which includes a survey, DEI section in the environmental scan, video messages, and brief training video. The board's current strategic plan is complete and DCA Solid will reach out to the bureau chief to update the plan to embed DEI in accordance with Governor Newsom's directive. In addition, all DCA solid trainers will soon be completing a 50 hour diversity, equity and inclusion training certification program through the University of Massachusetts. On April 28th, Director Kirchmeyer issued a memorandum on DCA's commitment to employees to increase the availability of DEI courses through DCA solid training unit. A DEI section has been added to the homepage of the learning management system where employees can access and register for three courses that will be available in June. Over the coming months, additional courses and educational information will be available. DCA's first diversity, equity and inclusion fact sheet has been released and was developed as an informational tool and includes the department's three DEI initiatives, memorializes DCA services that support DEI efforts and includes DEI terminology as it applies to DCA. On May 12th, the DEI steering committee held its quarterly meeting in person and elected a chairperson and vice chairperson. Yafana Lamar from CSLB will serve as a committee chair and Paul Sanchez, executive officer of speech language pathology, excuse me, pathology and audiology and hearing aid dispensers board will serve as the vice chair. The committee also discussed training, strategic planning and DEI activities through the end of the calendar year, as well as membership composition and processes to expand membership. As the DEI steering committee's work continues, I look forward to updating you in the months ahead on their progress. Equally important, I'd like to make you aware that there is a DCA wide mandatory training for 2023. Sexual harassment prevention training is required for all DCA employees and appointees including board and advisory committee members. Committee members must take the one hour non-supervisory training that is required every odd numbered year. The training is online, self-paced and takes approximately one hour. 
The sexual harassment prevention training is available in the department's learning management system. If you have any questions or need assistance, you may reach out to Board and Bureau Relations Chief Deputy Melissa Gear or Assistant Chief Deputy Yvonne Durantes. As a reminder, the next board member orientation training, also referred to as BMOT, will be held on June 20th, 2023. Advisory committee members must complete BMOT within one year of their appointment or reappointment. On June 20th, 2023, BMOT will be offered in person in Sacramento and again on October 10th at a location to be determined. Members can register for this training via LMS. Moving on, as all of you are aware, legislation passed last year amending provisions of the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act to extend the ability of state bodies, such as DCA's boards and bureaus, to conduct public meetings virtually through July 1. Absent the passing of new legislation to extend these provisions, DCA's boards and bureaus will not be allowed to conduct meetings virtually after July 1. DCA is aware of the legislation recently introduced, which removes certain teleconference requirements from the Open Meeting Act. The bill was recently amended to do the following. Require members of a state body participating remotely to disclose whether any individuals 18 years of age or older are present in the room at the remote location and the general nature of the member's relationship with those individuals. Require state bodies to end or adjourn a meeting upon discovering that a means of remote participation required by the bill has failed and cannot be restored. This bill does not include an urgency clause and would not take effect until January 1, 2024. Boards and bureaus should be prepared to conduct public meetings in person in the interim beginning July 1, 2023. And finally, DCA submitted its 2021-22 annual report to the legislature, and the report is now available on the DCA website. This annual report includes a new design and additional reporting metrics, such as military licensing data now required for all DCA boards and bureaus. We hope you will take the time to review this impressive compilation of the valuable work of the boards and bureaus. And this concludes the DCA update. And at this time, we'll turn the floor over to Chair Holt. And I welcome any questions from the board. Bureau, I'm sorry. Got it. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, advisory committee members, uh, do you have any questions or comments? This is Lee. I was wondering, Judy, if, do you have the number of that bill um, that uh, is pending in the legislature right now? I do. It, it's SB 544. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. This is Tess. I have a quick question. I thought I had previously heard that we might be able to have some sort of an exemption on the sexual harassment training if we have a similar requirement within the institution we're employed. Is that still the case? That is the case. And um, if you'd like to, um, provide the bureau chief a copy of your completion certificate. Um, that's what I would advise you to do. And she can forward that on to our DCA solid um, so they can put that uh, um, in your record or file. Perfect. Thank you. I'll do that by the end of the week. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, hearing no further questions or, or comments, we will um, at this time open for public comment for agenda item four and uh, the comments we've received from the representative of the DCA. We are now accepting public comment on agenda item four. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like we have a request from Dr. Alex Sherm. 
Hold on just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. All right, Dr. Sherm, we're going to send you another request to unmute your microphone. Allow me to read what is written. The question, is it possible to share the link for sexual harassment training? Is it certificate training? Okay, I I can look into that. And and I can Excuse me, Julia. I think we don't engage actually in dialogue with uh, okay. or in responding to questions. I appreciate, sorry, I know it's tempting, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. And there are no other requests for public comment at the moment. Very good, thank you, David. And again, as a, a reminder, um, a proper venue for questions or for support uh, for public members would be to email bppe at dca.ca.gov. Uh, to and they somebody there would be able to help you with a, a related question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judy. Appreciate it, and oh, you're uh, appreciate your time and all, and all the great work at the DCA. Okay, you're welcome. We will move on now uh, to agenda item uh, five, uh, which is our the the meat of our agenda today. Going through a series of, of letters on the bureau operations update. And uh, we'll go A through H uh, in this session. Debbie, do we need to do any juggling or should we just do, use the... We've got everyone simple schedule today, apparently. So we can go We can go in order and I can just give the little heads up on who's presenting on each, if that's okay. Um, Perfect. Yeah, we will take, um, we will take public comment um, following each of the letter sections because of the variety of subject matter. Uh, and of course, the importance to maybe members of the public. So I'm to you, Debbie, to walk us through. Perfect. Um, so uh, for 5A, we're going to start with our IT system project. And for that, we have two members of DCA's OIS, Office of Information Services. We have Jeff Alameda and Jeff and uh, Jason Piccioni. Thank you both for being here. Thank you, Chief Cochran. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jason Piccioni. I am the agency information officer for the business consumer services and housing agency, as well as the chief information officer for the department of consumer affairs. Thank you, chair Holt and members for allowing me to present this morning. Actually, I'm not presenting. I'm just, I brought a colleague to do that. I'm just here to tee up our next delivery of the IT system. Um, but before I do that, I have spoken in front of this group one other time. And I, uh, for folks who weren't there a few years ago, uh, I have a, uh, a, a keen affinity for the Bureau for Private Post-Secondary as in 1999, this is where I started my state career um, and worked for the Bureau for I think about five years. And though the sales system has come to become uh, somewhat of a, 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 a thing um, I am the one who I'm the software developer that wrote that in, in the, at the end of 1999, 2000. Um, so anyway, there's my connection to the bureau has I've been involved with uh, your work for a long time. So thank you for letting me be here this morning. Um, I'm just here to, uh, to tee up our next delivery of the uh, private post connect system. And it is a, uh, I think it's a really, really excellent uh, illustration of the evolution of the strategy of delivery that your teams, uh, department teams, et cetera, have put together uh, a roadmap since uh, probably fall of last year. Um, this uh, delivery includes, if it's focused on st uh, student tuition recovery fund, both the online abilities for uh, students in need to uh, submit a claim as well as back office staff to uh, hopefully efficiently process and get those folks uh, there, uh, get those claims processed and approved through the system uh, as quickly as possible. So we think that this is a another illustration of uh, a, the evolution of our delivery uh, in this in this uh, platform. And I'll bring my colleague 
uh, to the screen to go through some specifics of the uh, delivery that, excuse me, the release that was made uh, in the beginning of May. The first release was for back office and just recently within the past, uh, I want to say within the past week or so, the live link for the students to uh, submit claims online. So thank you very much. And uh, Jeff Alameda, I'll ask him to come to the mic. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff Alameda. We met uh, for the first time back in February. I uh, clearly chose the wrong shirt for a video call. It looks like uh, there might be a mountain hidden within this t-shirt somewhere. Um, but uh, thank you, Chair Holt and the advisory committee members. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with uh, IT update based on what Jason shared. Uh, as he mentioned, uh, since uh, our last update in February, we have devoted all our efforts to developing the and deploying the Student Tuition Recovery Fund claims application and review process. Uh, I prepared a slide deck of this new functionality and we'll be showing you that at the end of the, my verbal delivery here. This focused effort delivered the release of the new Strift claim functionality to our live production in April of 2023. We followed that up with the Strift application portal that went live on BPPE's website just in the last week. Uh, all releases come with their share of user experience issues, and this release was no different. We are continuing to refine and integrate new enhancements to the product in production. Developers have resolved all high priority issues identified post release and staff have reported the ability to process claim requests in the in the connect software. Uh, looking back for the past eight to 10 months, something that Jason also touched on uh, BPPE project leadership, along with DCA IT resources and the vendor have begun planning a smaller release mode roadmap to move targeted functionality more quickly to production that has been tested and has minor development outstanding versus holding it back while other functionality in the development is completed. So this is something I touched on last time as well, that we're continuing down this path of more iterative sprint development work, and then following that up with software production releases uh, more frequently moving forward. More functionalities from the prioritized buckets will be targeted for rollout later in the summer as we look for smaller scoped opportunities to deploy to production. Uh, I want to state that OIS and BPPE leadership meet nearly every week to assess progress and discuss the priority of projects efforts. And these meetings have been very helpful to me personally as I continue to educate myself on BPPE's licensing and enforcement processes. I want to say thank you to the BPPE leadership and the staff on their participation throughout this project. These types of IT system changes are big changes for an organization. They have shown a real commitment to seeing it through. I'm happy to answer any questions you have on the information that I've shared so far. Thank you. So advisory committee members, any uh, questions or comments at this point? Uh, is it gonna be further, are you gonna do further presentation or is that your entire presentation? The strip claim uh, functionality and what we deployed, Margaret, I'll be showing in a slide deck very okay. shortly. Okay, before you get to that, uh, I do have a question. <clears throat> this is Margaret. <clears throat> Last time uh, you had introduced us to the school search function, and there were a number of questions and comments that I had, and I think others also. And I wondered if you could give us an update on where, uh, what if any uh, progress is being made <clears throat> on that. Yes, I can. Thank you for asking. I recall that conversation well. Uh, based on that presentation of that functionality. So we've collected all of those comments from the previous meeting back in February. The product owner and I, along with the BPPE chief, have identified those items and we've recorded them in our JIRA ticketing software, which is the software we use to manage the development of this Connect software. So uh, the purpose behind that is to make sure that those items are accounted for, those comments are tracked, and those issues are raised in terms of priority for us to uh, continue to iterate and update the school search function. Uh, one item I will uh, uh, recall from that conversation was that school search function will not be deployed until we do full sale conversion, uh, which won't be uh, for a little while in terms of our priority buckets, but will be coming with that effort when we do full sale conversion. So those comments that you provided have been taken, have been documented, 
and will be taken into account as we continue to develop towards that full sale conversion date. So from that, I gather that <clears throat> nothing has been done yet on trying to integrate any of those suggestions. Not into a production environment, considering that this piece is not out into production yet, but definitely incorporated into the project management tool that will be raised to developers to make sure that we can incorporate the comments that are uh, required for changes to the school search. I think you're talking on mute, Margaret. Yes, thank you. What, what you showed us, I thought, uh, I, I don't quite understand, not until production mode, because I thought, thought what you showed us was what you intended to, I mean, that, that was to be sort of the final product or as far as at this point. Um, but you're not continuing to work on that and develop that now. You're waiting until later for, for I, I don't quite understand the, why that is. So, uh, yeah, let me explain both situations. Uh, that was a display uh, request for what we've built so far for the school search functionality, how, how we built it to that point in time uh, based on the February update. And then the take back from that is comments that you provided and the other uh, committee members provided in that public forum. We're also incorporating comments that we'll get from our user acceptance testers, which is basically the final validation of scope for that particular functionality. And so we take in all of those comments, all of those remarks, we uh, verify them against the requirements for that functionality, and then we set a release date. That release date then determines when we'll send this to a live end user production environment so that all end user stakeholders can access this product. Um, so that's the process that we go down in terms of system development and software development. So the piece, the, the point in time that we're at right now is basically the collection of comments and testing that functionality. And then we'll continue to iterate and test it until we consider it appropriate for an actual live production release when we do the full sale conversion. So you're not contemplating integrating any of those comments before you give it to the, or go through the step of user testing. In other words, users will be testing what we've seen without any improvements having been made since then. Those will be developed along with that testing. So they all get incorporated into the same bucket of comments. They may come before we receive new comments from actual BPPE staff testers. Uh, if the client and product owner uh, presumes that they're necessary according to the requirements for the school search. So yeah, they may be developed prior to or they may be developed in parallel with the user acceptance tester comments to make sure that we're all in alignment on what the actual end functionality looks like. Right. Uh, I guess my feeling is, and I, maybe this is something we can discuss later, but that when it seemed to me that there were certain things that were pretty obviously needed to be changed, that we, the Bureau would want to make sure that those changes are made those improvements are made before testing. So um, to have a little concern there. Uh, thank you for explaining the process, though. Yeah. Member Ryder, uh, this is Jason Bacconi, and I just wanted to add to the conversation a bit. Um, I think everything you you said is right on. Um, we we definitely will uh, hear the priorities that come through this group, through Chief Cochran, and through BP staff to identify those uh, work activities or improvements that you made, and those will be incorporated uh, through, that, through that process that Jeff talked about. So uh, they're in the queue uh, and they'll be uh, developed as uh, their priority is set. And I'm assuming since they came from this group, the priority will be set high and uh, they will go in that process and be developed and tested before that goes into production. Hope that helps. Or maybe it just confused it more, sorry. <laughs> Well, I understood that that whatever would be agreed on would be <clears throat> uh, integrated before it goes into production, but I understand production is a final step after it's already been user tested. Am I incorrect? Yeah, production would be after you user acceptance testing, correct? Right, right. My concern is that there's some changes that seems to me need to be made before you bother to have it user tested. In other words, you know, there's some things that seemed 
to me anyway, fairly obvious it needed to be improved. And I would hope that those would be dealt with before you start having it user tested. Um, you're, you're correct. You're absolutely correct. I, I think I'm, I'm not saying it uh, well. We're saying the same thing. You're, you're right. And the process that we do follows exactly what you said. The improvements that you suggested um, will be developed uh, before the testing, which will then go into, into production. So you're absolutely okay. correct. Thank you for the clarification. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before we see the STRIF demo from the advisory committee? And uh, we're, gonna, we're taking all of uh, 5A in its totality. And, and so um, this might feel like two agendas. We're still in the same topical area. Uh, I do uh, do appreciate, Jeff, your dividing that. Uh, and so if you could go ahead and move forward with your presentation. Yes, oh, one second. Let me get my slide up appropriately. Okay, forward, the next slide. All right, uh, title slide you saw there before you. Uh, the next slide you're looking at here is the STRIF user portal. So this is uh, what's been developed uh, and deployed, as I mentioned, in April of 2023. And then the live user portal link uh, went uh, onto your website just last week. The advantage of this user portal, different from other user portals, is that, let me get my chats out of the way so I can read my notes, is the fact that it's a unique access portal for stu uh, students to access versus the uh, institutions in that frame of mind. They come through a different access point, so students actually have their own specific user portal that they can access uh, the application through. It has appropriate branding to direct them to the right location. Uh, if they went to the institution link, perhaps. And uh, as I mentioned before, this went live uh, last month and the um, uh, application supports all of the claims that come through uh, OSAR in terms of supporting uh, processing of those claims. To the next slide. The STRIF user portal, the individual would then proceed to registration. Different from the institution process, we don't collect as much information as the institution in order to create a, create a registration. In that uh, frame of mind, it keeps the process a little uh, simpler, in fact, to allow the user to immediately access the portal and get their claim request in as quickly as uh, they'd like to. After submitting their registration, they are emailed a temporary password, and then the users are prompted to create a new password and then proceed to their own specific individual user dashboard. That dashboard uh, looks like this. So as you can see here, it's got some information uh, about the individual's name up at the top. It has some general personal information based on what they provided when they created their uh, registration process. And then off to the right hand side at the top, you can see a table that says new STRIF claim application and a new application button. That allows the individual to then begin their life cycle of submitting their claim request uh, to the Bureau. Uh, one point of note that I'll uh, update here is the educational credit request form on the bottom left in that uh, STRIF uh, claim uh, table. Uh, that will only appear uh, and only shows up when a student has an educational credit uh, request. So different from what you see in the meeting materials slide deck, and that's also one of those continuous improvement enhancements we've made since the system, uh, since the software went live and released in April. Moving on to the next slide. After submitting a claim, you have a slight difference in view here on the user's end. Uh, the student will receive an email confirmation that it's been submitted. In addition, the dashboard will be updated to show the in-process claim, as you can see there in the STRIF claim application table on the top uh, right of the user dashboard. And then, and then students can click the link to add additional details and documentation at any time 
to that claim request simply by selecting the application that's currently in that table uh, for them from their user dashboard. Moving on to the details of the STRIF application. Uh, this is what the application would actually look like if you selected new application button. The application data is grouped into tabs, as you can see on the left-hand side along, uh, along the left. The tabs are based on the sections of the paper application, so it's very similar to the current process. And we incorporated those sections into a online application to allow for ease of use and ease of adoption and transition into this new uh, feature, online feature for students. Uh, this allows staff to gather the necessary information in uh, organized tabs and, and allows us to make certain fields required in terms of completion of the application. This also allows us to offer optional uh, fields to the student in case we want to gather more information for the claim, but that may not necessarily be required. I'm not going to walk through each and every tab, but you can see here from the distinction between the tabs, the information that's collected similar to what's in the current paper application form. Uh, moving on to the back office processing. This is the back office workflow queue, and these are how the STRIF claim queues are located in the administration module in the back office. So when I say back office, that might be a new term for many of you on, uh, on the call today, but the back office is essentially where BPPE staff organize, review, and process applications. So it's essentially a behind the curtain view of what the PPP staff do on a daily basis. In this respect, specific to the STRIF claim, in other respects, we have a, an entire enforcement module that's been built out that's currently in production too. So that would be another component of the back office. But uh, for our purposes here today, the back office is essentially where BPE staff go to process the applications uh, for STRIF uh, today. The workflow queues allow for the organization and efficient processing of the claims, as you can see from the uh, queue labels listed there, uh, starting from the intake process all the way down to the approval process. And if an admin type feature needs to occur, then you have various OSR manager queues and admin queues to manage those uh, specific issues related to the claim. What follows uh, during the review process is this staff review tab. So in addition to the application tabs that you saw on the previous slide for the user that was completing the claim, in the back office, we have a specific staff review tab that allows us to collect all the detail about the claim to help us process, review, and determine, and determine the claim. Only BPBE staff see this tab. As I mentioned before, the back office is a behind the curtain view of the BPP staff and their processing path. And this is one of those tabs that's specific to them to allow them to update, document, and in input data regarding the claim to allow for efficient approval and processing. Uh, Connect has integrated previous external worksheets into the staff review tab. So that has assisted with streamlined processing of the STRIF claims. Um, once the current tuition recovery process uh, is approved in Connect, uh, the process that uh, in order to recover the tuition takes over externally from Connect in terms of uh, payment of that requested claim and tuition. That takes me to the end of the slide deck. Let me know if you have any questions. Very good. Thank you, Jeff. Advisory committee members, any um, questions or comments uh, regarding the STRIF app or anything under this agenda item? Uh, I have a few. <laughs> this is Mark. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, you said that this is live on the website now, I think, but I was on the website and I don't see it. I'm just seeing the regular strip application. Can you tell me where you access this? Yes, I just went there yesterday just to make sure my comment was correct. And if you go to the students tab, on the website up at the top on the across the banner yes and, and select the student tuition recovery fund right option then you'll see a, a sentence there kind of in the middle below the spanish uh language a sentence you may complete the application for student tuition recovery fund online using the bureau student tuition recovery fund portal do you see that i do there you go and if you select that, 
You're on your way to becoming a student claim applicant. Okay. I will tell you. Never writer. Oh, I'm, I apologize. I was just going to say, i tell you what I did, uh, which you may want to look at as an issue, is um, I went to the first uh, on that same page. And mm -hmm. now I'm sort of stuck here at the moment. Uh, yeah, on that same page above that, there is a thing that says application for student tuition recovery fund. So I'm assuming, gee, that's what I want to do. That's where I need to go. So I wouldn't go past the one that says Spanish and get down to uh, the one about completing it there. Um, so you may want to look at that page again, because the intuitive thing would be where it first says application. That's what I want. And I would go there. So I never got to this uh, thing down below. Just makes sense. Why. Thank yeah. you for pointing that FYI. out. Um, so um, the next, I guess, a comment I have is I don't appreciate websites that, well, well let me back up a second. Um, if this takes you directly to this portal, where is the explanation? Where does the student get the explanation of what a STRIF claim is and what, what the requirements are and stuff? Uh, just a general kind of explanation. Is that on that page? I mean, uh, on the regular page where I went, you know, the prior one, it did have some explanation, but does this just dump you immediately into having to register? If you select the link from that page, Margaret, as we just uh, went through, then yes, you're correct. It would direct you right to registration. Uh, there's opportunities there to provide uh, various instructional uh, options, either through the website uh, first before they access the portal or uh, within the portal in terms of instructional tabs uh, within the application that could be considered uh, options for additional education and outreach to these uh, individuals. Yeah, I think it would be helpful if the, there is some place where they automatically go through a thing explaining what is, in, students aren't necessarily gonna know what a student tuition recovery fund is or what they need and have some explanation before they get into filling out an application as to what this is all about, I think would be extremely helpful. Um, and then going on from that, um, the first thing you ask is for people to register. I do not like websites that won't give you any information, won't let you see what the process is, won't let you, you know, wander around and see what's going on unless you register and give your email. Uh, I think it's a privacy issue. I think it's also an off-putting kind of thing. Uh, it would seem to me that in many websites you have a choice to register now or later. And you might want to make it so they could register now or they could go through and then before they could submit their claim, then they would register so that they would all have to be registered, but you don't force them to register just from the get go. Um, so that's something if it can be done that I think would be worth looking into. Thank you. I have ideas on that. I'll take back to uh, Debbie. Right. So many times you're, yeah, you want to just get a little information and in fact you're, you know, set up and registered and so on. Um, on the page, the uh, portal, the user um, dashboard, yep. uh, you have a new application button, which on the version I'm looking at doesn't look any bolder than anything else on the page. And it would seem to me that if that's what the student is trying to do, that it would be helpful if they had a big bold, bold button that said, you know, new application, so that that would jump out there, at them fairly easily and not have to be, again, kind of um, looking at the same type size that you have for everything else on the page. Let me take a look at uh, you see, you mean on the slide, you're referencing the slide in that? Right, case? that slide, right, where you have the little arrow on the right corner, right. on the right side there, where it's, there's a, where it says new application. Yeah. The, the button they're supposed to um, push to start their application. It's just written in the same type size as everything else, and it doesn't appear to be any bolder. And I would just suggest it should be made bolder. Yeah, we can look at that. Um, 
And then you have, you mentioned that students can add more information at any time. And I'm just wondering for the Bureau's convenience, does that trigger an alert somehow to the people handling these forms so that then, you know, oh, I'd asked them to submit information and here it is, or, oh, I was processing it this way, but now they've added new information. I need to look at that. That's one I'll have to defer to the subject matter experts, Margaret. I don't have an answer for you. Right, and I, I don't know. I mean, that's really a bureau function, whether it would help them or not. It just seems to me it would be useful if that did trigger an alert so people would realize something new has been added. Um, and then um, on the page that I guess in our handout is numbered page 24. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a, they're asked for their email address, but if they already had to register, they already had to give their email address. So then they're not way. If you're going to keep the registration up there, then you're asking them to duplicate. It would seem to me that you know they ought to be you ought to be able to do it, so they only have to enter that once. They do. So if you look a little closer to that slide, the first yeah. name, last name, and email are grayed out. You can see that at all different from the suffix SSN and primary phone, how they're a white field. It's pretty hard to tell. I'm sorry on my copy is. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so in that case, yes, we only ask once. And okay. we pre-populate the application with the information they provided okay, uh, during the registration process. Okay. All the other fields that, um, are new in the application. So that's why we are asking for those. Okay, fields. great. I just couldn't see that on my slide. No, good, good comment. And um, I think that's all. I, I did have a thought here on the same page about where you have the different uh, portions of the application that can be accessed, which is the page, you know, 24. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there's really no explanation of what those things are here. And maybe that can be dealt with earlier, um, as I had mentioned before. But somewhere, I, I think there just needs to be a more helpful explanation. I just simplified language of, uh, you know, what this is and what what it gets them. Um, thanks. Yeah, you're kind of talking about what the student's going to endeavor on before he submits he or she submits the claim, right? Right, right. I mean, I don't think most students would necessarily know what the student tuition recovery fund is. Maybe I'm mistaken about that, but um, they're only going to pay attention to that when they get in trouble. And then, you know, they're looking around and maybe they see something that says complaints and think that's what they should click on. Um, but, but, you know, at some point, there needs, along the way, there needs to be explanations saying this is where you go for this, you know, brief summary of this is what, what it does uh, before they're just plunked into, you know, register and fill out the application. Right. Makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Advisory committee, any other questions? Oh, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, this is Lee. I, I have a couple of comments. Two of them, I think, might be more appropriate for the actual, like, the, the staff that handle the drift claims, but I'm just going to throw them out there because they relate to the, the website kind of function also. Um, so I did notice, like, kind of like Margaret mentioned, that students can update their application or can provide additional information or documentation. Um, and I'm just curious, sort of similar, like, is when, you know, there's the confirmation email when the application is submitted, are there also confirmation emails at other, you know, if additional information is uploaded, um, or is there a way for a student to sort of understand that their application is complete, um, you know, or do they just sort of, or is there a cutoff? It's sort of like a process one, you know, can they just continuously sub, uh, submit additional documentation, not knowing whether they need to or not? Um, so just sort of a, a process, like, um, maybe it's even a status where, you know, information, you know, once they know it's in review, they know that they no longer need to submit anything unless contacted by the Bureau. Um, I don't know, but just sort of a, a process sort of communication with the student issue, which is similar to what Margaret was mentioning. Um, that's and then good, the other one, oh, go ahead. Sorry. All right. It's a good question. That's all I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> um, and then the other one um, is on the the date submitted. Um, if this is, I guess maybe the question is with this application, it seems like since it's a login, they can start one and then log out and come back and complete it later. 
um, is what it appears like. And so if that's the case, um, I think some clarification of the date sub of the, the date the claim submitted would be helpful. I would assume that would be the date that they submit the complete application pending any you know further request by the Bureau. Um, but I think maybe it would be helpful for a student to know that so that they know that like just opening, you know, registering doesn't mean that they've initiated their claim. Um, and so maybe that goes into what Margaret was saying with providing a little more context to the STRIF in the in the beginning. Yeah, um, I, see, I see your differentiation there. That makes sense. Okay. Um, and then my last question is more just a comment. Um, I think the back end looks really interesting um, and I hope that that's helpful for staff. I would just love to maybe at like the August meeting or the November meeting, hear some feedback from staff on how the back end is working. Um, and, you know, like um, later on, it seems like in the materials, you know, it seems like there's some a number of claims pending. And so I would love to see if the back end helps them be more efficient, you know, helps them be able to identify deficiencies, et cetera. So not necessarily something for you, but maybe something just in general to get some feedback from the Bureau on. And that's all. Thank you. Good comments. Thank you. Uh, just Mark, just one, one more thing. I just uh, on the. Uh, yeah, I think those are good points that uh, we raise. Is um, on the uh, the issue of the initial web page where they go to uh, fill out an application. They apparently they had the choice apparently now of doing it either online or doing it in hard copy. And maybe that's what that first uh, sentence there in that page needs to say is. Uh, you know, check the box. Do you want to fill it out in hard copy, or do you want to fill it out online? And then it then it would take them to the online one if that's the one they check. Something like that, so that that um, it all appears in that first um, uh, in the first sentence there, rather than them having to follow down after that says in the Spanish language and so on. Makes sense. Thanks. Very good. Any other committee questions or comments? We'll go. We'll go open public comment uh, for this agenda item in its totality. Agenda item A by A. David, could you help with with that with public comment? My apologies. I was on mute. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, before before you go to public comment, could I ask one other question? Certainly, Margaret. Uh, and that is, um, uh, this is already online in production. So, how will changes be made, or how easy is it to make changes if you decide to make those changes? Uh, thank you. Member Ryder, uh, I the changes are, um, I guess I guess I'll categorize them as uh, complex, moderate, or easy, depending on the change itself, right? So it's commensurate with the request. If it was a sentence change uh, for wording and clarification, then that I probably would categorize that generally as an easy, and therefore the time would be equal to that. Uh, if it was large. Um, and and uh, you needed to do a wholesale revamp of the workflow, then that could be more complex and take time. So there is a sliding spectrum there. But overall, at this point, um, I think that we endeavor for a continuous improvement model based on user experience. And the comments that I'm hearing from both yourself as well as, as, well as Member Farron uh, are all excellent points and will be uh, fleshed out as we hear feedback from users, uh, students uh, who are using the system, uh, as member Farron suggested, uh, staff in the back office to uh, make sure that efficiencies are being are being realized. Um, but this is definitely a, specifically the online public portion is in a soft launch and all of those things that both uh, both members talked about will be addressed. Uh, the education through uh, uh, through uh, Mr. Valverde and his group in OSAR for making sure people know how, what, where, and why to do those things uh, will be had. And your points about improvements on the web page itself are very, very, uh, very, very on point. So that will be those will be addressed as quickly as we can. Um, I hope that wasn't too evasive. It wasn't meant to be, but it's just meant to be transparent. It was helpful. Thank you. All right. 
Okay, David, go ahead with public, public comment. All right, we are now accepting public comment. If you'd like to make a comment, please type the word comment in the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users, please dial star 3 to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to return to the agenda? Yes, please. And uh, Debbie, we'll move on to 5B, the licensing report. Uh, wonderful. For this update and the next one on quality of education, we will have Ebony Santi, our education administrator. Hello, Ebony. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will start with the licensing statistics for uh, quarter three. Um, in total, we received 656 applications. Of those, 25 were for a new um, non-accredited approval. 34 were for our new accredited approvals. We had 47 renewals for non-accredited institutions, uh, 71 for accredited institution renewals, 115 of those were for change applications. 132 of those were specifically change applications for accredited institutions. Um, we had 200 verification of exemption and 32 out-of-state registration. Uh, looking at our average days to approve, um, there were some changes. Um, we're still around 556 for new full approvals. And um, definitely we have done some um, behind the scenes work and triaged what applications have skewed those numbers and um, looking at processes that can make those go faster as well. Um, as far as the new accredited approvals, we're actually down 38 days. So that's an average of 103. Um, we are down for our full renewals as well. Um, we're down eight days for the renewal accredited institutions. Um, our changes are still around 125 days. 65 for accredited changes. Um, we're down a few days for the verification of exemption and the out-of-state registration is relatively the same. Next slide, please. Um, the oldest full application in our queue is now um, from July of 2022. Uh, that application is actually still incomplete. Um, our oldest full under review uh, is from June of 2020. That application has been assigned. Um, we are waiting for an approval from the county of that institution. Um, the oldest full renewal application under review has also been assigned, um, and there is updated information due on that application next week. The median date of the full applications in our queue are from January 2023. Next slide, please. We're at a total of 1835 locations divided up by 961 mains, 362 branches, and 512 satellites. Um, of those, 421 are approved by means of accreditation. Um, 506 are full approvals or non-accredited. Um, we do not have any conditional approvals currently. Provisionals are at 35, and we have 93 out-of-state registration, uh, which is up to from our last meeting. Um, I have not forgotten about your question, Margaret, um, with changes in the tracking system over the last few years, just determining the best way to present the information on the uh, locations that you And that, next slide. We actually um, are now including information on our workshops, uh, the licensing UNIT does present a workshop monthly for institutions to um, register and participate in. Um, those are hosted by a manager and an analyst in each workshop, and we walk through the non-accredited application, although accredited schools um, are definitely welcome to join. Um, we go through each section of the application, and we discuss some of the do's and don'ts of 
of what needs to be submitted with your application to hopefully help with um, smoother processing. Um, we have noted the number of register registrants we've had um, January, February, and March. Um, I did not have the April information, my apologies. However, we did have 26 registered for our May um, meeting that just happened this week. And then you can also see our upcoming um, dates in June, July, and August, and schools, our potential schools are able to register for those workshops on our website. And that is all for the licensing information. Very good, thank you. Uh, thanks uh, for including also information on the workshops. I appreciate uh, that. In, uh, and going forward, I'm assuming that's something that you could repeat so you can see how many people are registered for those. We are. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, advisory committee, any other questions on agenda item 5B, the licensing? It's Margaret. I would just echo your comment, uh, Joseph. Uh, thank you for getting that information on there about the upcoming workshops and the pathways. Appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, this is Tess. Quick question on the workshops and yes, agreed. Thank you. I've also attended and they're very well done. So I just wanted to thank the Bureau for that as well. Um, question though, will the workshops remain online after the July 1st date? Uh, definitely with that change came up, we'll have to discuss and assess. Um, I know that a positive of them being online is obviously more people and able to access because there was a variety, the state's very large. And so I know in the past, we only had a minimum amount that went out to certain areas. So this allows people to join from anywhere, obviously. Um, but definitely, we will discuss that and see how to move forward. Okay, fantastic. And then secondly, uh, logis just a quick logistic question, and forgive if you've mentioned it previously. When you um, say an incomplete application, is that considered an application that you can't work because of pieces that are missing? Correct. So there, um, our initial application has uh, for a non-accredited institution has about 26 sections. So there needs to be a response to all of those sections um, in addition to the application B to be um, assigned into the queue to an analyst. So if someone is considered incomplete, they're missing something. Okay. And then do you check for, for compliance at that point? It's just a check to make sure that it's complete. Okay. And then lastly on that, are you then, um, is it counting against you, I guess is maybe a better way to put it for those that are incomplete as we look at the, the timelines and the number of days, um, is that counting yeah. against you? Yeah, it definitely has an impact um, because, you know, uh, this one has been almost a year incomplete. You know, there is a point where we can abandon an application, um, but it's not uncommon for something to be three, four, six, eight months incomplete uh, before we can assign it to an analyst. So all of that goes into days and right. approval process. And great job, by the way, with all the reductions essentially in most of the categories, two days here, eight days there, 60 days. I mean, that's, you know, Every little bit helps. Definitely. Right? Exactly. Um, but, um, is there any value in that data? And, and I just wasn't looking at it previously in that manner, but to differentiate and, and forgive if it already is differentiated, just to try to have buckets of essentially you're controllable versus non-controllable. I'm sure there's follow-up with the incomplete application, but you're it's somewhat out of your control to some degree too. Um, just kind of curious on if that's any value to, to provide that. Yeah, I mean, that would, that would go with probably to the chess clock analysis we've discussed in previous meetings. Are, are you right. monitoring that? I know that that it does, we discuss ways to analyze that information. Um, you know, I don't know how um, valuable it would be um, in this particular forum to present on each application, like the issues, but it does um, give myself as well as um, the Bureau Chief information on um, how applications are moving, where are our hangups, what can we do better um, to affect those numbers um, and that average processing time. So definitely something we're using internal to make sure that we're as efficient as possible. 
Okay. And I'm thinking even the possibility, I don't know how challenging it would be, but to have, you know, here's the average time for completed applications and here's the average time that we have, you know, just to separate the two so that there's a more of a true measure for what you can control. Because uh, there may be even uh, more improvement in terms of the number of days. Just a thought, uh, you know, great job again on reducing it. Um, but there's probably ones in there that I'm sure are quite troublesome for you. And <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll make a note of that and definitely take that back for discussion. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Related to that and carrying on just a moment, Ebony, is the uh, at least in aggregate, I'm hopeful over time that we would see some reporting regarding that chess clock separation. Um, maybe not certainly at the at the app level, right? Like that doesn't make sense. I, I hear you on that, but in the aggregate level, like for it for a body of applications for this period of time or for all pending applications, I know you only recently started um, measuring whose court the ball is in, right? But reporting on that in aggregate. So for you, know, so your for example, our median application is this long, our longest time to complete is that. And then 85% of days are in our court and 15% of days are in their court, uh, something like that. Because uh, there's risks on either side, whether it be institutional frustration or um, uh, a lack of you know, urgency or capability on the bureau side to, to uh, talk about, about the anecdote. Like one of this, the, to the point there's friction on this, it comes to the outlier and talking about that. So, but looking at chess clock summative analysis in aggregate, I think could be helpful. What is the, how much time is the ball in your court compared to others with a large enough data set? And Debbie, I think your original analysis was like back, backwards looking. You looked at a body of sort of closed cases, if you will, and then divvied it out. Are we measuring Ebony? live going forward, do we have an active a chess clock analysis on all applications going forward? Um, yes, we determined that we were looking at those that were complete and at least um, six months in time in processing as far as the chess clock. That was kind of a, at this point, I could determine it to say, OK, okay. This has been here for a lot of time. Why is this taking? So that was kind of the cutoff point, but definitely we can assess those values as we move forward. Yeah, if there's some way to operationalize it to where it's not, it's just parallel with existing work as opposed to like an ad hoc backwards looking analysis, maybe it might be helpful. So that is for consideration. Sure. Thank you. I will also add lastly that we um, are in the process of recruiting um, for a manager one in our unit, as well as the replacement um, chief for the unit as well. This is Margaret. I would just add to what Tess uh, said. I, I think her point is well taken and also Joseph. Uh, and I think besides uh, just what we talked about already, you know, when the legislature looks at what the Bureau is doing and how it's doing it or when schools uh, are lobbying the legislature to say what the Bureau is or isn't doing, that number, like, for example, for the new full approvals, which is, you know, over 500 days, uh, if, if, if somebody from the outside is looking at that and saying, my gosh, this bureau is just really hanging around doing nothing, they're so slow, blah, blah, blah. And in fact, you know, large portions of that are because the application is not complete or they ha haven't provided enough information. It's important, I think, just for the public to understand that. Uh, so, I, you know, Again, I don't think we want to burden you folks with more, you know, data so that you're having to deal with data and not actually do the work. But um, some of that, if there's a way to address it, that probably would be very helpful uh, for public understanding of the bureau processes. Definitely noted. Thank you. And a huge thank you to the licensing team, um, as always, working hard to keep us moving forward. There's a direct analog, of course, for student complaints, right? Like your time to resolution on student complaints is you have you don't have information you need from the student or you're waiting to hear back from the student. So I know that's a separate topic area, but the same issue applies on you. Absolutely. Side. Chair Holt, this is Christy Shields. I'm quick comment if you wouldn't mind. Please, yeah. So there was some discussion uh, earlier on about the July 1 date. I assume we're talking about the change in the Open Meeting Act. 
That should not affect the online trainings that the Bureau offers. Those are not board meetings unless a quorum of this committee somehow decided they wanted to go to one of those trainings. So it should not impact the Bureau's ability to provide that WebEx or other platform for providing training, in my opinion. So just want to clarify for the record that the Open Meeting Act will not affect those those trainings, those changes to the Open Meeting Act that are going to be coming effective July 1. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for the quick answer and clarification. And Tess, I think that addressed uh, the question you had posed. That's great. All right. Hearing no other committee comments for the uh, licensing report, we will open for public comment. David, would you do that? We are now accepting public comment on the licensing report. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're gonna take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, please. So we'll move on to 5C and the quality of education report. And Ebony, that's, you have that. It's me well. again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the next slide, please. Uh, so this is just an overview of the status of 1247 schools um, who were approved to offer degree programs prior to January 1, 2015. There actually have been no changes since our last meeting. Um, 46 of those schools are accredited, 49 have closed or their approval has expired. Um, 19 of those schools went exempt, uh, two are on an extension, uh, 22 surrendered their degrees and four have had their degrees suspended um, for again, a total of 142. Next slide, please. Uh, the one change, uh, we had another institution become accredited, so we're at 16. Uh, 12 have closed or their approval has expired. Two are exempt. 13 have surrendered their degree programs. Eight have suspended degree programs. And we have an additional school from our last meeting now pursuing accreditation, so we're at 35 for a total of 86. Next slide. Just a combination of all of that information. Again, we're up to 62 schools who have obtained um, accreditation. And then next slide with the breakdown of accreditors, uh, the change being uh, the new school has now been approved by APES, um, which is the Accrediting Bureau for Health and Education Schools. And that's all the information for quality of education. Thank you. Could you remind me, we've been tracking this forever. And so uh, can you remind me when the when this ends? Like when is the deadline for disposition? For I, should know, but I I've forgotten. Wait, uh, I'm sorry. What was the last part? Uh, I've I've just forgotten. I'm sorry. It's been uh, we've been tracking it, you know, for so long. When is the sunset? Like when does it end? Right. So for the institutions that were prior, the point one, if you will, um to mm -hmm. We're really only looking at two other schools. One is at the end of, um, that should be up. There's an, been some extensions, so it would, yeah, right. yeah, so I believe they have to 2024 now at this point, the full extension, but um, I hopefully don't anticipate that those schools will take as long. Um, and for the provisionals, um, without any extensions, there's two years to become um, a candidate and then um, and the five to be fully approved. Got it. Okay. But there can be extensions on either part of that process. Right. Okay. Mitty, any other questions uh, on this, on the quality of education report? It's very good. We go ahead and open to public comment on agenda item 5C. We are now open for public comment on agenda item 5C. If you have any 
request for comments, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right-hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial-in users, please dial star 3 to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, thank you. And so we'll move and thank you again. I really appreciate it. Debbie, on to 5D annual reports update. Perfect. Um, so our next two updates, both for annual reports and compliance and discipline, will both be done by Elizabeth and Elias, our enforcement chief. Good morning. Morning, welcome. The annual report unit currently has three vacancies. All um, positions in the annual report unit um, are currently in the recruitment and hiring process. The 2022 annual report um, is due December 1st of this year. This is a reminder to the institutions that the annual report consists of the annual report submission through the portal where they are required to enter institution and program data, upload school performance fact sheets, catalog enrollment agreements, and graduate identification data. In addition to the portal submission, institutions are required to submit financial statements by mail in hard copy format. Um, all components must be received for that, for that annual report to be deemed complete. Next slide. Um, this slide demonstrates which months institutions start the process to submit the annual report through the portal. Um, what this slide does not demonstrate is that the report was actually submitted or deemed complete, just the month in which they began the process to submit. So they've gone into the system, they've opened a workflow. Um, that's what this identifies. Um, as you can see, the trend is pretty much the same through each of the um, months where the majority of schools wait until November to submit their annual report. I do encourage schools to submit it earlier because um, there are times when the traffic is so high that there are some technical um, errors because of the amount of traffic. So we would definitely recommend schools to submit the reports sooner than the last month. Um, also, due to inter report outreach efforts, um, at this point in time, most institutions have at a minimum begun the process to submit the 2021 inter report. And that you can see in the column where it says institutions who have not initiated submitting an inter report. So, we're in prior years where there were about 50 schools that hadn't done it. As of May 3rd, we only have about nine schools who haven't even. Um, started the process. Next slide. Um, as requested at the prior committee, we did collect the data on the school performance fact sheet workshops that were conducted. This fiscal year, we've conducted a total of seven workshops and have reached 87 participants. Um, the interreport staff conduct these workshops to help institutions understand the laws and regulations as it relates to the school performance fact sheets. And our next workshop um, will be June 23rd. Um, so that concludes the report on annual reports. If there are any questions. Thank you, Elizabeth. Advisory committee, any questions or comments? This is Margaret. Um, for past years, um, this this doesn't sh or this shows us uh, institutions who haven't even initiated uh, filing an annual report for those years. Um, so, uh, have, what kind of actions have been taken uh, to enforce or punish those who haven't uh, provided their annual reports for those uh, past years, if any? Um. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, later on when we get to compliance, I'm sorry, with discipline, um, you will see an increase in the number of citations that we've issued in this last quarter, um, primarily 
the efforts are due to um, identifying the schools that haven't been re submitting their annual reports. And we've been issuing citations um, with orders of abatement um, to have them submit what was past due. Um, and so you'll see those numbers shortly. Sorry for jumping the gun. I'll have another question about that when we get there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, I'll move on. I'm no, sorry. Actually, real quick, I did have a question. I was just waiting to see if anybody else had brought it up before. You mentioned, you opened by mentioning your vacancies. I think it was three. You have three positions open. How yes, I do. Yeah. How many total right, do you have in the, the, the uh, annual reports department? Three in annual reports. I currently only have two staff who are holding down all of the work. Flow that okay, is so coming you have five seats. So you're you're down. You have three vacancies in a total team of five. Right? Correct, and one of those vacancies is the manager. Right. Okay. This is Lee. I had one quick question as well. Um, I, I actually, you know, I noticed that there's been a huge, not a huge, but like a decrease for sure in institutions who didn't initiate submitting an annual report, which seems like a really good thing because it means you're actually getting the reports in. And I'm curious if you if you have any correlation, like is that connected to just institutions getting more comfortable and familiar with the process? Is it due to more outreach by folks? Or do you have any sense of, of where that, you know, why institutions are more able or more willing to get their reports in? Um, I think it's a combination of outreach and also also disciplinary actions that we're taking um, in getting the schools to come into compliance. And I and I think it's primarily attributed to the disciplinary actions, thus basically forcing the institutions to come into compliance. Margaret, one more comment. Again, also thank you uh, just to echo uh, for putting on those uh, workshop dates both past and upcoming. Thank you. Welcome. And one other question, Elizabeth, I, uh, you're reporting on people who open an application as opposed to who completed one. I'm assuming that's a data frailty. Like, or is there some reason we can't report on how many are complete? Um, at this point in time, this was the easiest um, data point for us to collect to show who um, have submitted. What we have found that a lot of schools uh, will open a, a workflow to start the process, but then they don't actually complete the submission. And so there are a lot of schools who may submit the portal portion, but not submit the financial statements. Um, and that is deemed not a complete in a report. So we may pursue um, enforcement efforts in the form of citations for those. Um, and therefore, for us to gather that data, it's a little bit more complex um, to determine where they're at in the process. Um, it is something that I can look into trying to gathering for a future meeting, um, but at this for this meeting, we weren't able to gather that data. Got it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. If seeing it in future when you're able uh, would be would be helpful because obviously it's more meaningful rather than measuring how many people started a marathon, how many people mm -hmm. <laughs> actually <laughs> finished. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is Margaret. Uh, I mean, perhaps if you just captured the date, uh, the end date when they're supposed to have completed it, how many had completed it by the due date, uh, maybe that's it. Uh, because I assume you're pursuing some of these people that are still trying to complete it after the due date, but it would be very good to know how many have completed it by the, the due date and how many haven't. Yes, yeah, so it's something that we can work on providing um, and uh, probably a data point we could capture more quickly um, with the next report that will be due, um, since it might be something that we have to capture at a point in time, um, where right now, because time has passed, it would be hard to go back and capture who completed within the required time frames. If, if I could just chime in here, I want to, um, I would echo that last point that Elizabeth just made about, you know, this might be something that we can look at going forward. Um, going backwards might be harder. Um, I just want to really give a I mean, I think you're you're going to hear and you've already heard about a lot of good progress from the team at this meeting, but I just want to particularly highlight, you know, I know up until a couple of meetings ago, there really hadn't been data presented on annual report submissions and the progress there. And, um, you know, as as Elizabeth mentioned and, and Joseph, you highlighted the team is right now quite small, um, but very mighty and they've really have embarked on 
um, a very ambitious path of, you know, understanding what we're seeing more and coming up with different outreach or discipline plans that make sense for the institutions that are in different situations. Um, you know, from it, from just to highlight from a disciplinary standpoint, it does sort of start to make a difference if someone even started the process, maybe got caught up in a technological glitch versus never started it at all. So they've really been incredibly thoughtful um, knowing that this is new work for for the staff and we're trying to chart new chart new or break new ground on this area. So I just want to pause and underscore, I think we'll have more opportunities going forward now that we've started down this path, but really just to give kudos to Elizabeth and her team for everything they've been able to accomplish in this in such a short time. I just echo that to Elizabeth, but also to you, Debbie, for, for moving on. This was one of the questions I think I raised a while ago is what do we know about you know, annual reports being filed or not. And I'm really glad to see the progress. It's terrific. Thanks. And I would just, in more of a macro global point, I think that it's indicative of institutions that are going to struggle broadly with uh, uh, their awareness or effectiveness following regulations. And, and and so it can help focus. It's not just in a silo. If, if a school isn't doing their annual report or isn't aware of the annual report, that's a pretty fundamental element of approval and so they're probably unaware of or struggling with other areas and so they're an institution that either needs enforcement action or coaching you know on, on either side of the coin so you could use that as a list that could inform uh, debbie some of your other focus of resources in terms of either visits right or good point joseph All right, we will open for a public comment on the uh, agenda item 5D, the annual report update. We are now open for public comment on 5D. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box at the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. And it looks like our first request comes from Lene Ray, hold on just a moment. We're going to send you a request to unmute your microphone. For um, answering or just, I just wanted to bring up uh, one thing with the annual report. Uh, clarification of where the hard copy financial uh, statements need to be sent to, which department, um, would really help because um, like we've always done like with the invoice and the check and the hard copies all in one. Is that the right place to go? Thank you for your comment and you're welcome to carry on. But again, we can't engage. Oh, you can't answer. I'm sorry. Correct. I forgot. <laughs> That's just the comment. <laughs> And with that, there are no other requests for public comment at the moment. Great, thank you. And then to, to, again, a quick reminder that um, questions can be emailed directly to the, the BPP email address, or uh, I would assume Elizabeth even maybe uh, you could email you at the, at the Bureau there to get an answer or support uh, with that. And we, of course, can take that feedback or to make sure that it's clear so institutions know where to do that. Yes, I do welcome any communications from institutions that need clarification, and I will respond to them um, as quickly as I can. Great, thanks. All right, uh, and moving on to agenda item 5E and the compliance and discipline report. Okay, um, so I will be discussing both compliance and discipline together, and I'll hold for questions at the end of both presentations. Um, just as an FYI. So currently in our compliance units, we have two compliance units. There are a total of five vacancies. All of the positions are in the recruitment and hiring process. Um, completed inspections are on track to meet the number of inspections conducted um, last year, fiscal year 21-22. So it's been a consistent steady pace um, as we've moved through each of the quarters this year. And although staff have conducted more announced inspections this year, uh, management does consider many factors when determining which type of inspections should be conducted. And we will assign unannounced inspections as needed 
based on those factors. Um, but just due to the nature of having to complete one announced and one unannounced inspection for every institution, the pendulum is kind of swinging towards announced inspections at this point in time. <clears throat> And then um, next slide, please. This is just a visual of the announced versus unannounced inspections. Next slide. Um, so of the inspections completed this year, about 46% of the inspections required additional action, which was either through a notice to comply for minor violations identified um, during the compliance inspection or through an enforcement referral for any material violations that may have been identified. Um, next slide. And then um, we also collected the data on the compliance workshops that have been conducted this fiscal year. To date, we've conducted 14 workshops and have reached 286 participants. These workshops are conducted to educate the institutions and prepare them for a compliance inspection. And the next workshop will be held on June 15th, 2023. Next slide. Um, and we'll move forward to the discipline update. Our discipline unit currently has two vacancies. We've recently finalized interviews and are in the final steps before we can make an offer of an employment. So I hope to have those positions filled very, very soon. Um, next slide. During the third quarter, the Bureau was successful in the revocation of the approval to operate for two institutions one of which was the outcome of a hearing and decided by an administrative law judge. Um, we were also successful in being granted a PC-23, which is a order um, against one of the institution owners. Um, and we have placed one institution on probation. Next slide. For actions resulting from a statement of issues, which is a charging document related to a denial um, of a new or renewal application for an approval to operate an institution, we were successful in upholding one denial that was decided by uh, an administrative law judge through a hearing. Three schools were able to satisfy deficiencies uh, after the denial and were granted approval. And one school withdrew their appeal and the denial was upheld. Next slide. Um, there were no additional um, enforcement actions, no emergency decisions or automatic suspensions during the third quarter. Next slide. The discipline unit currently has a total of 16 cases that are pending with the Attorney General's Office, 10 of which have been filed and are pending a final outcome. The cases that are filed are public and can be found on the Bureau's website. And then last slide. Um, in this last quarter, discipline staff have been work focused on working through a backlog of enforcement referrals, and we have issued 62 citations. Most of the citations issued in the third quarter were primarily for annual reports, annual fees, failure to pay annual fees, failure to submit um, the student tuition recovery fund forms and collection ass assessments. Um, discipline staff are continuing to work diligently on and are on track to meet or exceed the number of citations that were issued in fiscal um, year 21-22. Next slide. I'm also happy to provide an update to our website. We have added a list of disciplinary actions um, that are done by month. And um, so if you visit our website, you will find um, each month for this current fiscal year and a list um, and a link to a list of actions um, that were taken. So the actions are actions filed. Those are pending disciplinary actions that do not have a final outcome. Um, and then the final outcome as well um, for each of those actions taken within that respective month. And then um, at this point, I just wanted to mention overall that my continued focus is to fill 
all of my sections vacancies as expeditiously as I can. Um, I, along with my management team, we continue to review our business processes to review uh, to identify any areas where we can be more effective. Um, we've made a lot of changes within each of the units that have allowed us to be more effective despite the many vacancies. Um, I can only imagine what our units will look like when we're fully staffed um, since we're being, we're, since we're able to maintain the numbers um, that we've been able to maintain so far. Um, and I also just want to say that I'm thankful for committed staff who are dedicated to the Bureau's mission and I just want to acknowledge their hard work um, and also thank um, two staff in our compliance units who have also assisted with some of the additional um, resources to work through some of the annual report um, focus that we have been trying to get through at this point in time. And that concludes my presentation for compliance and discipline. Um, if there are any questions or comments. Very good. Committee members, any um, feedback or questions? This is Margaret. Um, a couple of uh, couple, three things. Uh, I finally think I have it in my head that accusations relates to ongoing schools and a statement of issues relates to new applications. However, it would be helpful if in your, in your uh, slides where you comment on that, you would just put that in parentheses to just remind us who will keep forgetting which one is which. Uh, that the accusation refers to, you know, problems with ongoing schools and statement of issues refers to new applications. That would be greatly appreciated. Um, then on the, uh, I, on going back to the uh, failure to file the annual reports, um, what, what uh, is there any sort of typical remedy that you seek or does it vary quite a bit across the board? I assume you could, it would be everything from, you know, get your annual report in and to uh, some kind of uh, financial penalty to uh, possibly um, uh, enforcement by considering revo revoking the approval to operate, et cetera. Uh, can you give me a, some sense of um, what kind of remedies you're seeking on these citations for failure to submit annual report? Yes, um, in regulation, we have um, definitions of different classes of violation. Um, a class A violation is the most egregious type of violation that um, a school can have. And we've identified that the failure to submit your annual report um, is considered a class A violation because it is an egregious failure for the school to submit the annual report. That fine um, varies between $2,501 to a maximum of $5,000 for each violation identified. So if a school were to fill, fill to submit two years worth of annual reports, they may have two violations, um, two class A violations. Um, so the majority of institutions do receive an administrative fine um, and then an order of abatement to come into compliance and to submit their um, in a report, which includes the portal portion and the financials. Um, what I will say is that uh, many of the schools submit their um, portal portion of the annual report, but they fail to submit their financial statements. Um, so that is one of the items that we're trying to address and follow up um, with some of these citations that are being issued. Great. Thank you. And um, one other comment I have on the website update, I appreciate being able now, this is one of the things I've been asking about for some time to, to find out what um, uh, actions were done within, you know, certain time periods. And I appreciate that. Um, one thing I would say, your explanation, uh, I got a little lost, which could be my fault, but I will just mention it in case others had a problem. Uh, the, it says the documents listed below the institution's name include information regarding the citation. What happens when you follow through this, you go, you find the current month of citations, and under that there's a list of schools. Uh, and so I'm looking, and I'm clicking on the school, and nothing's happening. I'm looking below, there's nothing there. And then what I realize is, it means that you have to then go back to the list of schools in the website and click on that school there. Uh, so it's like you're going step one, step two, step three, back to step 
you know, uh, to go to a different page, if that makes sense. I, I figured it out, but it wasn't really quite intuitive. So either it would be great if there was a link directly from that, um, here's the current uh, actions, uh, to be able to click on one of those schools there and be taken directly to the citation uh, or to the school site on the website. Um, but if that's not possible, then maybe just the explanation needs to be a little clearer that you need to then go back to such and such page where all schools are listed and find the name of the school and go from there. If, I hope that makes sense. It does. Um, the adding links to the actual document was considered at the time. However, due to um, times when links are broken or things have to be updated, um, those links may not be functional in the future. So on the page, there are instructions to follow um, to how to obtain the document uh, from our website. And I can go back and review the instructions to make sure that they are clear um, and update them if necessary. Um, but uh, that was taken into consideration and unfortunately it, it, it didn't seem to be the best approach considering that links can be broken and may not be functional in the future. Right, I think that if in your instructions, it's just number five. Uh, the number five, okay. Yeah, because the documents, you're on the page, it shows the recent actions, it lists the school name, uh, but it, from here it says located below the institution's name. So I'm thinking, okay, right here on this page, I click on the institution, nothing happens. But what you have to do is then leave this page of showing the recent actions and go to the page in the website that has the alphabetical listing of all schools, search there for the school's name where then the citations are listed or the actions are listed. So it was just was not clear that's what you had to do. Thanks. I see. I can clarify that on the instruction page. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments, feedback? Okay, we will open then for uh, public comment uh, on the Compliance and Discipline Report 5E. We are now open for public comment on the Compliance and Discipline Report. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, please. Thank you again, Elizabeth. And Thank you. On to our uh, complaint and investigation report. Okay, and for that, we will welcome Enforcement Chief Daniel Rangel. Hello, Daniel. Welcome in. Hello, and good morning. Um, so just see an update on our vacancies uh, for our unit. Uh, briefly, we have one manager vacancy. Uh, one analyst vacancy and one office technician vacancy. Um, and that's out of uh, 21 positions that are within our unit as a whole. Uh, so we're getting very close to that fully staffed, um, which I'm very happy um, to uh, report. And I know that we're working diligently on these three vacancies to um, get them filled as quickly as possible. Um, so just, just happy to, to report that information. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so this is our complaints received. So the complaints received, uh, we saw a slight dip in quarter two. However, that quarter is flanked by spikes in, in both quarter one and quarter three, uh, which has kept our overall monthly average high across all three quarters. Um, our averages per month, uh, per quarter. Uh, so for quarter one, our average per month uh, was about 106 complaints per month. For quarter two, that was about 89. And then quarter three was about 96. So overall, we've we've been consistently in in the the ninety per month uh, across all three quarters. If you average those three out, uh, which is consistently high, 
uh, compared to um, previous years. Next slide. So the second slide is uh, shows our uh, complaints received from, from fiscal year to fiscal year. Uh, we received a total of uh, 1,051 complaints uh, in 2021-2022. Uh, through three quarters of this fiscal year, uh, we project that we will receive um, about a little over 1,100 complaints. Uh, so it is it is continuing to rise um, if you're looking at the trend from the last three fiscal years uh, going into the third quarter of this one. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide is our complaints closed uh, per month. In, ja in January, we saw a significant dip in the complaint. The complaints closed that month. <clears throat> However, January numbers were impacted by time off by staff, both staff and management, uh, which caused a brief delay in cases uh, being reviewed and edits for cases that were near completion. Um, so this is evident by the noteworthy, noteworthy number of, of closures in February and March. Um, our two highest outputs for that for this fiscal year. Um, so it, it's uh, it was just a, a it wasn't uh, something that was consistent with what we were seeing. But if you average out the three, it's it's pretty consistent with the amount that we were closing uh, in prior months. I believe if you average three out, uh, it's about sixty four per month. Next slide, please. Uh, so this one is our our closed complaints and the days that it took to close it. Uh, so our goal has been um, to close our complaints within 180 days. However, due to the significant number of complaints that we've been receiving, our focus um, as a unit has been on resolving complaints that are over um, or close to a year. Um, when we look at our goal, however, currently um, about two thirds of our complaints have been closed in the 180 days, um, but I know that just due to the amount of complaints that we have, um, as we'll see later in our case aging um, section, um, that that goal is uh, becoming uh, increasingly challenging um, because because of the amount that we're receiving and, and uh, we can only work as fast as our resources allow, uh, which we are continuously um, and diligently working to um, resolve. Next slide. So this is our case disposition um, of the cases that are closed, what categories they kind of fall in. Um, I would like to note that like our, our mediation, compliance, obtain and resolve schools um, is similar to our uh, referred to discipline numbers. Uh, this is a reflection of our efforts to be proactive uh, to address con uh, student concerns when opp opportunities present themselves. Uh, generally, this is before there's any violations occur um, when we have an opportunity to be proactive um, and interactive in that process when students raise concerns. Uh, so these are efforts are also reflected in our impact section, which you'll see later in our in the report. And next slide. Uh, so discipline unit referrals. Um, so uh, of our 54 referrals, 33 were for unapproved activity. Um, this emphasizes our efforts to both protect students while also ensuring a play, uh, level playing field for our approved institutions. Next slide. So complaints closed at intake. Uh, so majority of our, our cases are closed at intake fall within the exempt non-jurisdiction category. However, our wonderful intake staff make every effort to connect these uh, complainants to resources or agencies that might be able to assist them better. And uh, next slide. So this is our pending cases. So as I mentioned earlier, we are making a concerted effort to keep the pending uh, caseload down uh, by uh, investing in our greatest resource, which is our staff. Um, so we are focusing on training, uh, developing and equipping our team uh, to conduct, conduct efficient and thorough investigations, which is very important, um, not just getting through the investigation, but ensuring that we're doing our due diligence and and um, and, and conducting a thorough investigation uh, to identify any potential issues. Uh, so our efforts include weekly check-ins with staff 
on case progress uh, management, um, has established clear directives on conducting investigations. Um, and we're seeing the progress and growth of our team, um, many of whom are still in their probationary period, as I, I've mentioned in previous um, advisory committee meetings that we had a significant turnover in our investigative team. Um, and even those that are have been here and the more the seasoned staff that have been with the Bureau for quite some time are, are also in a transition period um, as they make adjustments to, um, as we make adjustments as a, as a team and identify areas for improvement um, and uh, of the quality and efficiency of our investigation. So um, there's a lot of new things that we are introducing that um, they're also trying to get uh, familiar with. So uh, as a whole, um, we, we are in a transition period and uh, we talk about how change is not easy, um, but um, we also talk about that there's no comfort in growth. There's no, uh, no comfort in growth. And so that's, that's our emphasis and, and keeping our eye on, on what our goal is and that's uh, protecting students. And um, that's what we are mindful of. Uh, next slide. So um, with this trend line, we're beginning, we're beginning to see that the trend line for pending cases uh, level, level out a bit. Uh, this is also consistent what, with, with what we are seeing um, currently. So we are, we are about two thirds of the way uh, into our, uh, into the, this fourth quarter. Um, and as of the end of last week, we had um, about 111 cases pending. Um, so that trend line has continued to stay flat. Um, even moving into this new quarter, which is not reflected on this um, this slide um, yet, uh, but it but it is just um, uh, a reflection of of our efforts that we are beginning to kind of catch up to the demand. Um, and as staff continue to progress and grow um, and develop and become more comfortable with some of the changes that we're making um, and becoming more familiar, they are able to make quicker and more accurate decisions. Um, and we're able to move along in that investigative process a lot faster um, while also keeping up the high level of quality that we're emphasizing. So um, our hope is that that trend line will eventually begin to level down. Um, we don't anticipate it'll be through the amount of cases that we're seeing, but more so the amount of, of output that we're putting as far as uh, completing cases. Uh, next slide, please. And then, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our efforts to be proactive in investigations to advocate for students are reflected in the amount of refunds to students. Uh, these are efforts. Uh, these efforts are also examples of collaboration um, with other bureau units, specifically OSAR, um, and also collaboration with the institutions as we balance enforcement of, of laws with best best outcomes for our students uh, and the student protection. So the total number there, uh, two hundred twenty five thousand dollars. Um, it's it's a huge jump from what we saw, what we reported out in our prior meeting. Um, and I believe this had happened some time ago, but we were monitoring to ensure that those students did actually receive the refunds before we uh, closed the matter out. Um, so now that it is closed out, we can um, accurately reflect that in our uh, reporting. Um, but overall, I, I just wanted to, to thank um, my team um, and the management team for their support and their efforts to continue to, um, you know, trust me um, in, in the decisions that I'm making and, and that, are, that they're going to be best for the unit and best for the Bureau overall. Um, we have been working some very uh, complex investigations and looking at it from an investigator standpoint, um, having done it for many years. Um, I understand the challenges that they're, they're facing with some of these uh, cases. Uh, so, but I'm grateful for the support of the management team um, and the can-do attitude of our investigators um, to meet those challenges. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. And that concludes my report. I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Committee, do you have uh, feedback or questions? for Daniel. This is Margaret. Uh, Daniel, a couple of questions. Uh, we've talked in the past about with the new IT system, uh, the types of uh, complaints should be, you should be able to break them down more. 
And I'm wondering uh, if you know where that process is. These seem to be the same categories of uh, discipline referral categories that we've seen in the past. Um, and I'm just wondering, is there, has there been a change or where are we on trying to get uh, more refined categories of complaints? There has not been a change, but we have um, internally been having those discussions about what what categories we want to reflect and how we want to present this information, um, taking into consideration all the feedback that we get uh, from the ACM uh, meetings and then also uh, just internal discussions uh, about uh, what categories um, could be combined, what categories need to be broken out. Um, so we've had those internal discussions um, and then also presented that information to uh, the Connect team about the possibilities of, of making those adjustments. So it is something that is a part of our plan uh, to do because we are thinking about not just reporting to the advisory committee, but our statistics, our annual um, our performance measures to DCA and being consistent with that information as well as is, is the data that we're capturing consistent with that so we can easily translate it uh, to those those reports. So uh, we're taking a lot of those things into consideration. So it is an active discussion. Um, and um, I, I do want to see it uh, improve. And I know that there's room for improvement there. Um, so we are working on, on that actively. I guess this, I mentioned this in future meeting topics, but that might be something to be nice to have a report on as to what your ideas are going forward for that, um, maybe next meeting. The other thing I have a question about is that complaints closed at intake. Um, <clears throat> I'm just wondering, it, well, uh, one question, uh, why so many duplicate entries do you think? What's what causes that? Um, from the feedback that I got from our intake staff is um, sometimes um, and the complainant will submit a complaint and then they have additional information and they'll they'll go through the, the system and submit a second one with some attachments. Um, so we have been, um, and I know that it's within our performance measures for DCA to uh, get an acknowledgement letter out to any complaint that we receive within 10 days. Um, so we are trying to um, get more information in those, that, that, those letters uh, to let them know that there is additional information that where to send it to, to our enforcement um, email section rather than trying to submit another complaint. Um, so that, that's something that we are also looking at. Um, and have had internal discussions about. Is there or is there going to be a system somewhat similar to what we were shown today for the STRISP system where um, you would have a complaint open online and then um, you would have a number so you could get back into your complaint to send additional information rather than going through this where they're having to send it and it winds up looking like a separate complaint? Uh, I'm not aware of that capability, but that that is something that we can look into. Um, and I just got a note from one of our uh, staff members as well is that um, another reason for the duplicate is that sometimes we get referrals from other uh, boards and bureaus or other entities, and then the student also subsequently files a complaint with us. Um, so that that is one of the more significant reasons um, rather than the duplicative um, uh, communications with uh, a single complainant. And the, the other comment, and I don't, I don't know there's really anything for you to do about it, particularly in your unit, but uh, seeing how many of these complaints are non-jurisdictional because the Bureau just doesn't have jurisdiction over certain things, I'm just wondering if there shouldn't be or could be something on the website making it clear what not only what the Bureau does uh, supervise, but what it doesn't supervise uh, approved by the Bureau. And so maybe that's something that's not really for this topic, I guess. That's something for to bring up later. Thanks very much, Daniel. Yes, I appreciate the feedback. Any other questions or feedback for Daniel? This is Lee. I just had um, a couple of questions. One I think is going to show maybe my ignorance or forgetfulness. One of the two, I'm not sure. But um, what's the difference between contracted and non-contracted complaints? Um, so the contracted schools are those that um, they are exempt from the Bureau of Law, but they require to have a contract with the state agency in order for them to satisfy requirements for Title IV. Um, That's kind so. of what I thought, but I wanted to make sure. Um, I probably should have just gone with my gut, but that's okay. Um, 
And then um, that the caseload, you know, definitely like I can see it's growing, right? And that is, um, you know, I know with with staffing, that's a challenge. I'm wondering within that caseload, are you all do you have some sort of internal system to be able to prioritize, you know, complaint? Like I know there's some some indication that some complaints are urgent, you know, that sort of thing. Are you, is there a, a way that staff can do that? Not that anyway. Yeah, I'll just leave it at that. Other than just order of submission. Yes, so we we are uh, actively looking at ways to improve our complaint prioritization, um, but then also looking at um, those opportunities for um, cases that are kind of quick issue cases that are easier to resolve um, and making sure that we get those addressed quickly. Um, so there's, there's a number of things that we're looking at um, just in terms of prioritization and um, when, when uh, a uh, an investigation gets assigned, uh, who it gets assigned to, um, so all a lot of those things we're we're working internally, um, along with also just actively working on our connect system and how do we utilize that system to uh, best help us track all of this information and get good data that we can uh, make decisions with. So um, there's a there's a lot of <laughs> a lot of that going on internally. Thank you. All right. Hearing no other questions or comments from the committee, we'll open to public comment for agenda item uh, 5F, the complaint investigation report. We are now open for public comment on agenda item 5F. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star 3 to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a second now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, please. All right, we'll move on next to agenda item 5G, uh, the OSAR report. Uh, and of course, for that, we will turn it over to Scott Belverde, that's our chief. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Chief Holt. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. So I'm happy to provide the report for the Office of Student Assistance and Relief. Um, I, I'll start by also kind of chiming in what a few others have mentioned in terms of our staffing resources as well. We've got um, two vacant positions, uh, one soon to be vacant position and another position where the person's on leave. So we are uh, pretty, pretty well impacted right now by by that, but uh, also kind of increases my um, pride and appreciation for the work that that current staff are doing uh, under those uh, conditions. So thank you for that. Also, just before we jump into the charts, I just want to just briefly piggyback on a, a earlier a comment that that Jason made about OSAR as it relates to the STRIF uh, uh, online portal. And I just didn't want to step on Jeff or, or Jason's comments at that time. But just to add to that, you know, about OSAR's role in uh, communicating to students uh, what STRIF is about and uh, when STRIF is applicable and how best to access STRIF as a resource um, and, and, and filing the application, et cetera. Our, our, our commitment to doing that work as it has been up to this point with the PDF version of the application will certainly extend, if not you know, exceed into this world of having both the portal and the PDF version as well. So. You know, we're talking information. You know, in our in our content, our outreach content, our our emails, our presentations, staff talking points, and training, et cetera, will all will all uh, encapsulate the transition to the online portal option as well. So, um, I I totally agree with all the positive feedback about improvements to the language on the website, and and we will extend that to the language that we put on OSAR's website related to STRIF as well, but. Um, again, I, I appreciate Jason's comments that there's a, an element there uh, in terms of um, a high percentage of the students who are finding their way to that portal. The strategy is to have them do that with OSAR's assistance along the way and through that process. 
Um, with that said, uh, going into the chart, so um, our first uh, uh, reporting here is on our informed cho choice outreach. Uh, so picking up uh, on the quarter of the reporting, if we can go to the next slide, basically starting with um, January through through current. Um, so if we can move to the next slide, so we're controlling the slides. Uh, we have done, um, thank you. So picking up with our events in January, uh, our CalTAP events in partnership with CalVet, uh, three very successful uh, Black College Expo events in which we uh, participated. So you're seeing the event and also uh, the total number of students that we've reached at those events. Uh, moving on to the next slide, um, you'll see that we also um, have a couple that I wanted to highlight in particular that happened recently that take us up to our to running total for the year of, of 16 such events that we've participated in and almost 5,000 students, as you can see, that we've touched. Um, a couple new opportunities. One was a connection that was made with California State University East Bay. We've all, also had another subsequent event there as well in partnership with CalSOAP. So kind of a growing um, relationship there. Um, and then also um, an event I wanted to highlight, which was the webinar that took place on March 23rd um, that was hosted by the Department of uh, Financial Protection and Innovation, DFPI, um, uh, in partnership with the U.S. Department of Education and also ourselves. So we were the three agencies involved that delivered this webinar as part of a series of webinars that DFPI is hosting. Uh, this one specifically focused on um, borrower's defense to repayment program. Uh, the closed school discharge programs, obviously U.S. Department of Education led the discussion around those. I also uh, participated and talked about STRIF and OSAR's resources in general and how we help students uh, access the programs that the department talked about, which were the borrower's defense and closed school discharge programs. So chalk that up as a success, um, you know, 77 uh, attendees in that event and, and hopefully opportunity to do similar uh, uh, events with DFPI in the future where we help provide content as well. Uh, we also had a very large, well-attended uh, uh, regional, uh, local, sorry, college college fair that took place in Stockton recently with about 2,000 attendees and um, staff had a really positive report about all the connections that were made there, um, included both, you know, um, public and, and, and private for-profit colleges and other educational resources and financial literacy resources, et cetera. And again, very well attended. So, so on the proactive outreach side, things are going well. Moving on to chart B um, is our uh, outreach that we're doing for, for closed schools. Um, if you can swing the chart there for me, please, the next slide. Um, we have uh, continuing this trend. Actually, you can go one more, more, more forward into this quarter. There we go, thank you. So picking up from January, um, uh, a continued trend towards, which you'll see in the next chart as well, continued trend towards doing closed school outreach uh, through the methodology of initially reaching out via, via an email to the rosters that we have and then setting up individual one-on-one -on -one student appointments um, or phone calls or in-person meetings with those individuals as opposed to the more traditional, you know, in-person, uh, everyone in one place at one time workshop, which kind of, we saw that trend coming uh, around the time of COVID and it continues um, um, where this is a, a more prevalent approach. Um, the California Truck Driving Academy and South Bay Massage in particular has resulted in about 50 STRIF claims that have come in uh, from that outreach. Um, so, you know, it's, it's I, I think it's, you know, a, 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 a couple of things. It's a it's a preference when when students are provided option of an in-person workshop or a webinar or a one-on-one -on -one appointment. More and more are are leaning towards the that sort of one-on-one -on -one approach. And now with these tools that we have to do that, I think I think I think it is a preference. Um, and it's also you know logistics and things like that. Um, but um, as we speak, ironically, we are, my staff are actually out on site right now at a, at a closed school workshop. So that pendulum is always subject to, to swinging, I, I, I would say. Um, so moving on to the next chart, um, again, which is the uh, actual workshop. So I think I've been with OSAR from, from the very, very beginning. And I think this is the first quarter we've ever had where we didn't actually have a closed school workshop. Um, so. But you will you will see some next next quarter. Like I said, we're out we're out doing one right now. Actually, 
So if you move on to chart D, um, you kind of seeing that filtering of those that email contact, that initial uh, remote contact that then is then kind of distilling down into phone calls that include one-on-one -on -one appointments on these varied topics that students often have questions around. Um, that we're continuing to log and drop into data elements, you know, based on these categories that we see uh, most commonly of where student need is um, around STRIF. Again, still the, the number one topic, back to my open, opening comments, uh, still the number one topic that we're working with students on. Uh, also, other types of student uh, loan relief, um, private and federal loan relief. Um, school closures and program outreach. So a lot of the logistics around again, how do we, how are we going to get the best and most direct information about this individual closure? So some of those are logistical calls. Some of those are our calls, um, direct one on one appointments uh, with students as well. Uh, informed choice consultation, transcripts assistance, and other, you know, student records continues to be. Um, a reason a lot of students reach out to us. And then we're continuing to look closely in those other categories, um, looking for if any particular topics that elevate to a level where we should probably re be reporting out on those separately. Still seems to be quite, quite a hod hodgepodge in there. We had quite a few calls this quarter about uh, some unlicensed activity. Um, there were some questions that uh, actually were more appropriately referred to other uh, or, uh, agencies, but uh, we still took the opportunity to tell them about OSAR services and and uh, complaints are another one as well um, and, and complaint related issues either they filed a complaint and they're following up on it or um, asking for assistance with help with complaint etc so that's what we're seeing in other both in phone calls and also in our next uh, slide which is chart e which are our emails again we're tracking tracking closely those those same um, sort of element. So that is it for my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has. Very good. Thank you, Scott. Any, uh, any feedback or questions from the commission? This is Lee. I have a, a couple of um, comments slash questions again. Um, I, I think you, you started to address this and I think um, one of the things that's really interesting is is like looking at the amount of folks who compare, you know, email versus in person, and the emails versus the phone calls, and kind of the numbers. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess what I wonder is if there's any correlation. Sorry, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if that's on my end. I'll try to. I'll try to lean closer or something. Um, but um, I'm wondering if there's been any like, you know, and you mentioned it, but I wonder if there's a way to present it to us. You know, when you say. We sent out this email um, uh, campaign about this school and we got 50 STRIF claims as a result. Like, I think there's some kind of evaluation that we can see of the effectiveness of the email campaigns and being able to identify, you know, this really is reaching students or this isn't a very effective method and we need to try something different. Um, I think there could be some interesting data that comes out of that. And maybe it does depend on the school and the student population, but um, I do think it could be interesting to have some of that reported. Um, and then I had one other question on the trends. Oh, sorry. Did you want to go ahead? No, I, I was just going to say you're, you know, you're reading, you're reading our mind. You know, we, the, my staff that works closely with me on, on pulling this data together from our various sources, we've had conversations exactly along those lines recently about, uh, especially as this sort of evolves, um, and this becomes more of how, how the sort of workflow is 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 flowing? Like how do how do we capture that in terms of the origin point being you know an outreach campaign, and then how it filters down into these other services that we're then providing to those students more directly. So we're 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 thinking we are thinking right along with you. And another uh, element that we're uh, vetting internally right now is to try to use surveys a little bit more as well. Um, you know, in, we're we're starting it out as sort of an internal sort of pilot idea, but. Um, you know, we'll see where that goes from there, but definitely getting some direct uh, feedback from from students on some of those questions that you're asking, you know, about about, you know, you know, the effectiveness of the tools that we're doing, the, 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 the means by which we're reaching out and hopefully getting to all those students who could benefit from our services. I think I think there's a, a survey, a more sort of a direct survey element to explore there that um, that we're looking at also. 
Yeah, it's one of the things that talks gets talked about a lot in legal services is like, what's the impact of doing an educational presentation? You know, like, we, yes, we've increased our education, but how many people act on it? How many people yep. share that information? So, yeah, lots of really interesting things. No 100% answers at this point. But <laughs> um, the other question I just had is, you know, I saw a couple spikes like in calls, like in December, there was 100 plus phone calls. And in the, you know, the four months before there was, you know, zero to six. Is that because there was a school closure in that month, and there was, or is it connected to outreach? Like, do you do you have any idea? Um, I, I I would say that it is. I mean, I I'd have to, and that is actually we can pin that probably a little bit more closely based on um, specific categories in which they're following up on. You know, like if uh, that would be easy to do. Like if they're if they're following up and we're staff are logging them in as a as a as a call related to STRIF assistance or student loan assistance in particular, I mean, we could definitely log what school that is as well and then sort of correlate those numbers to individual previous outreach efforts. Um, that's not something we've done to date. So given the fact that we haven't, I can't answer your question um, kind of off the cuff, Aaliyah, but I, I think we could probably connect the dots. And I think systematically we could definitely, you know, figure out a way to collect our data in which that we would be able to answer that. Um, Sort of inherently. I mean, I think I think in real time for sure. Like we know we know what's going on. If there's a hot one in particular, whether it was a, a closure or an event we did or a workshop we did, you know, we we definitely do prep calls for staff, who particularly those who are on the phone, so that they they know what's going on before the outreach goes out, and so they're coordinated and and are ready and have done the research on those schools before the phones start ringing and the emails start coming in. So we do build that in. Um, so that we're prepared for those spikes as much as possible. Yeah. Thank you. This is Mark. I have one uh, question or comment. Uh, looking at the STRIF portal today sort of sparked some other uh, questions in my mind that relate to other aspects. Um, on the uh, uh, web page for the Bureau, there's a topic for different things under students, one of which is the uh, was OSAR. But I'm wondering if it would be possible under uh, complaints uh, to have, when you go to complaints, to have a something that says, need help filing your com or filling out your complaint, see OSAR, and if possible, a link to OSAR. Same thing with STRIF, need help, you know, than uh, a thing that would refer people over to OSAR. Uh, I wonder if that's something that can be looked into for the future. And on the, on the um, and, and this maybe relates just more generally to the web page. I notice OSAR has um, a page of FAQs. And I think FAQs are a way that is very user friendly for a lot of things, that it uh, might be useful for the Bureau to have some FAQs on its main page or very easily gotten to from the main page that would give a you know thumbnail of you know what these different things are, including, for example, OSAR. Appreciate that. Anything else from the committee for Scott? Very good. We'll open uh, for public comment on agenda item 5G. Uh, Office of Student Assistance and Relief. We are now open for public comment on 5G. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a few seconds now if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? Yes, please. Thank you. And to round out agenda item five, we're going to 5H and the STRIF report. Perfect. And for that agenda item, we have Yvette Johnson, the Administrative Chief at the Bureau over our STRIF unit. Hello, Yvette. Hello. Welcome in. Good morning. Just hit you before afternoon, so yes, it's still morning. <laughs> Um, so today I'm going to be providing information on the statistics regarding the work that's being accomplished in the Student Tuition Recovery Fund Unit. 
But before going into the statistics, I'd like to thank the committee members for their comments regarding the regarding the online strip application. We really want to take what you said into consideration because our goal is to make sure that our online application is student friendly and user friendly. So as Jason Piccioni mentioned that what we're doing right now is a soft launch for the Student Tuition Recovery Fund application online. So as we continue to work with it, we'll be sure that we beef up the information that's available to students and we'll make sure that we are working with the OSAR unit to ensure that there's outreach to the students as well as our own STRIF analysts working with the students directly to make sure that they have a clear understanding of what's available to them through both the paper and the STRIF application, the online application. Um, we've also discussed with our, well, not discussed yet, we've put in, in motion that the ability to work with our legal aid entities to use them kind of as guinea pigs as they're helping their students fill out the STRIF application. So we want to make sure that they are aware of the online strip application and as they work with their students utilizing that that um, process. Great. So um, Richie, can you go to the next page, please? So um, on this page, you see that there's a comparison of the um, second quarter of 22-23 with the third quarter of 22-23. And uh, the claims we received, we received over 77, we received 77 claims within the third quarter of 2023, which is more than double of the claims we received in the, in the second quarter. And as we go down to the strip claims that have closed, we have, for this third quarter, we approved 128 claims. We have 10 claims that were deemed ineligible. And within, with the claim being ineligible, that means that the student has not met the criteria for filing the STRIF claim. And the criteria for filing the STRIF claim can be found in the STRIF application. We have nine categories of qualifying events. And when an application is filled out, we want to make, we make sure that the student falls into one of those um, nine categories. We have one claim that was denied. And with that, that claim was denied because we could not determine that the student has suffered an economic loss. We have 27 claims that were where we could not get in contact with the student that were closed as unable to contact. That means that after trying many methods to contact the student, whether it be by telephone, email, snail mail, carrier pigeon or whatever, we have not received any response from the student and with that, we were unable to make a determination for the for the um, outcome of that application. And when we file it as unable to contact, that means that the student has the opportunity to come back and reopen their claim at any time. We also utilize LexisNexis as a method to try to see if we can get more current information about the student. But it's only after multiple attempts that we close that claim out as unable to contact. So within that third, within this third quarter, we processed a total of 166 claims. Next slide, please. This depicts the status of the claims that we are currently working. So there are, there are currently 271 claims that are under review. And that means that the analyst has completed their review of the claim and has forwarded on for uh, and made their recommendation and they have forwarded on for review by management. Analysts are currently working processing 78 claims. There are the claims that they have that they're working. Um, there are 69 claims where they're waiting for a student to respond. And then we have a total of 589 claims that are currently in queue. And those are the claims that have not been assigned to an analyst yet for working. Next slide, please. So this is the status of our student tuition recovery fund. Um, this 
this chart shows you the amount of money that currently we have claims that are pending at the state controller's office. We have 42 claims at the state controller's office, and there's a total of $595,180.17 that's waiting to be paid out to students. Um, for this fiscal year, for the third quarter of this fiscal year, we have paid out two million sixty-five thousand six hundred seventy-one dollars and thirty-two cents for for a total of one hundred twenty-one claims. And as of the date of this report, our strip balance was twenty-two million one hundred forty-nine dollars, one hundred one hundred forty-nine thousand five hundred eighty dollars and fifty-nine cents. Next slide, please. And this is a depiction of our large impact closures. We have our schools, which are the Heald, the Wild Tech, Everest, which are part of Corinthians, and then we have our Silicon Valley. Those are the claims for which we paid out the most amount of money that have, have the largest impact on the Student Tuition Recovery Fund. And that concludes my report for now. And, oh, I did forget, Margaret. We have not forgotten about your request for the for the timeline of a of a strip claim. Unfortunately, due to so many changes in processes and systems, we are unable to get a comprehensive report going. But we're still working on it. We're still looking at it. So um, it's something that we can probably get you in the future. But unfortunately, we're not, we were not able to do it for this this report. This is Lee. I had one um, comment. There's um, with the implementation of this new online portal. I don't know if there's any expectation by the Bureau of to like as if that's going to increase the number of strift claims coming in. Is it going to make it maybe more efficient to handle the claims? I think it just there's you know a lot of claims pending now, um, and if and I'm curious if you know if there's kind of. I know the portal has been live for like a month and but it's only been you know on the website for a week so you maybe don't really know yet but i'm just curious if there's any indication of what that portal will do whether it will help you know increase efficiencies etc in terms of processing claims we that is our goal we are hoping that it would help <laughs> process them more efficiently and it would help decrease the amount of paper that we have <laughs> um we're hope it would be more direct and it'd be a better way of communication because when the students have to, when the students um, create their account, they have to have that email. And so, you know, we're hoping that that would prompt them to constantly check that and check their portal and see what the status is. And it would, it would ease the communication as opposed to trying to call and we'd have that immediate communication. I was thinking it might cut back on some of, or hopefully, like ideally cut back on some of the, um, like, chasing people down and, and all of that processes, which probably would help process claims overall more quickly. But um, yes. but I do think it also could lead to increased claims, you know, if it's a little bit easier for students to get them submitted. I think it was you that asked the question about if a student wants to submit more information. Yeah. Um, we have requested that that be added and we had already requested that that be added into the system so that we can be, it can just ping us real quick to say, hey, this student has submitted more information with, with your request. But right now, because we are kind of still a little hybrid situation, we will, if we need more information, we contact the student and we let them know, hey, this is what's missing. Can you please send this in? Got it. Thank you. But, but once they do register, they will be able to upload that information into the system. That's cool. This is Margaret. Thank you. I'm glad you're still looking at my question to see if there's a way to get that information. It is getting worrisome, or maybe I just am not comparing with private ones, but 589 people in queue, that's, that seems like a lot. So uh, I will be interested uh, to hear the progress next time. Thanks. Yes. That, and just so that you know, that is actually lower than um, what we had at the end of 2022. And 20, at the end of 2022, we had six, 690 claims in the queue. So we are lowering it, even though we are 
receiving more claims, our queue is still going down. Thanks for that reminder. That's good. It's still high. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Um, so I have a, a, a question, comment, maybe maybe this is more for leadership generally than specific or tactical or that in the case of STRIF, but um, I'm, I'm concerned that we lose an opportunity with a teachable moment, specifically with the Silicon Valley closure in the, at the meta frame level. This is a radical um, event uh, that the average claim for paid claims is uh, nearly $20,000, but $18,300. For all other claims, for all other closures, which has been an unprecedented ten-year period of closures, generally, the reason, therefore, for this deck or this slide on large uh, institutional closures, it's about six thousand um, dollars per claim. We're only halfway through paying down the Silicon Valley closure. We have uh, probably another eight to ten million to go, and so it's a that's a huge radical event based entirely on. Uh, or substantially on there being international students that are paying full full cash. Um, in this case, um, it's something that would require obviously statutory um, review, but this is a, I think by any reasonable measure, a distortion of the purpose of STRIF. And fundamentally, students are paying, uh, California resident students are paying into STRIF and they're grossly disproportionately paying for um, this the the closure of Silicon Valley. So I think there's got to be a better way uh, to approach that. And I understand that the regulate the regulations interpret the statute, and it's just something I'm curious, Debbie. And maybe we don't have conversation here, but um, I, it's not business as usual. Is basically what I'm raising to the uh, to the forefront here, and it's something that the that the legislature should be aware of and engaged with. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I don't think you would hear any disagreement from anyone on our team that this was a, this was kind of a very large event in the history of the STRIF program. So obviously can't really speak to, you know, you know, the need or potential for statutory change or, you know, legislative intent with that. Um, obviously, we did. I can't remember the meeting date off the top of my head, but we I know we did have at least one discussion kind of more in depth about the school and some of the factors you just laid them out. Um, I would also just say, um, you know, certainly agree with what both Yvette and Margaret said there. We're, we're making progress on these numbers. They're still large. Um, these that type of an event, whether wherever it happens in the bureau has long lasting implications in some cases while we work through it on staffing. And um, it's also happening in this case as we're, um, you know, we've made some changes to how um, how uh, the strip work is um, performed internally at the bureau. And I know some of the longer standing advisory committee remembers members will remember that there was some tension in the past about kind of STRIF staff versus OSAR staff and what was the real appropriate role. So, you know, we've still been, we've been working to make sure that we've got very clean lines there. Um, uh, we've been working on connect. So there's a lot of, there's a kind of a lot of evolution at the same time um, when we, when a, when a big event happened that we did take also some time to make sure we were considering carefully and appropriately under the statutes that we have right now. So I think that's that's probably all I can say now. We are tracking it. We're trying to stay on top of them and um, you know get back to a good kind of rhythm and, and cadence in terms of claims, so that way we can we can process them quickly and expeditiously. But certainly, our our aim and our charge is to implement the program in line with the statute and and statutory intent as we as we see it as it exists right now. Understood. Thank you. Advisory committee, any other questions or comments on agenda item 5H? Okay, we'll go ahead and open for a public comment on uh, the student tuition recovery fund. We are now open for public comment on STRIF. If you would like to make a comment, please type the word comment into the Q&A box in the lower right hand corner of the screen and send that comment to all participants. Dial in users, please dial star three to raise your hand. We will call on people in the order we have requests. We're going to take just a moment now to see if we have a request for public comment. Seeing no request for public comment, do you wish to continue? 
Yes, thank you. And thank you, Yvette. Thank you. All right, that brings us to the end of agenda item five. And a committee, I wanted to sort of look down the road a ways where uh, just shortly after noon, um, we are going to need to take a break um, for lunch because we have some sub substantive conversations in future. Six, I, I expect, might be relatively um, straightforward um, on the re regulatory changes and stuff that we've seen before. And and I don't I don't know that there'll be a lot of feedback, but but we surely will walk through that with diligence and care. Um, but we do have, as you all know, um, a good request for meaningful substantive feedback on the challenges with the um, exemptions and with the, the that process, the applications for exempt status. And, and you've seen in the memo um, some very uh, clearly and well articulated questions for our feedback. Um, and I know we're all excited about that conversation. And so we do need some time and attention and probably some calories um, to to inform that. So we want a, a break for uh, for a meal. Um, question for the group. Um, obviously, we want to respect everyone's time. Is 20 minutes too short? Um, some 20 to 30 minutes, which, which what do you guys want to do for our lunch break? Either is fine with me. 20 minutes is fine. But if folks want extra time, I understand too. I'm fine either way also. It's Tess. Okay. Any concerns with the 20 minute break? No, I'm fine. Okay. Great. So let's let's go ahead and do that now. Let's break for 20 minutes. It's 1210 and we'll reconvene at 1230 and then take up uh, agenda items six and seven and uh, carry on from there. So 20 minute break. Thank you all.